righty. Well, good evening, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me okay? Yes. yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, I think you'll need to give me permission to share my screen uh, so I can put my presentation up. I'm not sure who controls that on your end, but uh, let me know when that happens. Uh, just a little bit of background here. Uh, again, I'm Alan Volke. I'm a Actually, my profession is a field application engineer. I work for Tektronix, but I've been an electrical engineer for about uh, 40 years and uh, looking forward to retirement, not too far down the road, I hope. <laughs> so, but uh, been a hand for uh, since about 1980 or so. And uh, I'm also the technical coordinator for the Northern, Northern New Jersey chapter of the ARRL field organization. So anyway, let me, uh, let me get my presentation started here. And uh, let me see, let's do a, let's do, you all see that as a full screen? No. Uh, yeah. 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 All right. Very good. All righty. So today's talk or tonight's talk, we're going to talk about some practical information about test equipment that you have in the shack. I mean, some of these things you probably all have, maybe like a DMM or a VOM or multimeter. We'll talk about some things that maybe you didn't realize about those instruments and how to use them and how to apply them. And we'll also talk about one of my favorite topics, oscilloscopes. So we'll talk about both analog and digital scopes and then touch on some of the applications for this equipment as well. Uh, I'm not sure how you normally handle questions with a remote presenter. I'm happy to do either way, like in line or just handle them at the end, uh, whatever you feel is best and what works for you guys works for me. So, so here's our agenda for tonight. Uh, we'll first talk about meters, uh, both analog volt ohm meters, uh, you know, VOMs, as well as digital multimeters or DMMs. And we'll even touch a little bit on de bench DMMs as well. And then we'll jump into oscilloscopes and talk about uh, analog and versus digital scopes, pluses and minuses of each of those technologies. And then we'll take a little bit into, uh, for, especially for new users of scopes, you can kind of get... Uh, intimidated by the sea of knobs on the front panel and all the controls. So we'll just kind of break it down and talk about the vertical controls, the horizontal settings, uh, the concept of triggering and what that means. And then also talk a bit about probing and getting signals into the scope accurately. And then uh, and then we'll uh, touch a little bit again on some sh shack use tips, you know, for oscilloscopes and things like that. So uh, with that, uh, we'll get rolling. Oh, and by the way, down in the bottom corner, you may know that I've got a YouTube channel. It's just uh, uh, youtube.com slash my call sign, W2AEW. I've got uh, 300, over 360 videos up there now. And I don't know, don't forget how many million views or whatever. But if I've got any videos that are associated with topics that I'm talking about on a particular slide, you'll see a reference to that video uh, down here in the uh, the lower portion of the display. So you can kind of make note of that. All my videos have got numbers associated with them, so it's easy to search when you're on my page. All right, so let's jump right into the analog volt ohm milliammeter, or VOM, and some of its operational features. Uh, the vast majority of VOMs have got a manual range selection, meaning you've got to think about what you're trying to measure. If you're measuring voltage or current, you've got to ensure that you set it to a range that is greater than what you expect to measure. You can always turn it down later, but you don't want to start at a low scale. You want to start at a high scale. And then the range that you pick determines which scale you're going to be using on the display itself, you know, in terms of making the measurements. What I'm going to do here, let me put in, I put a screen pointer on here so you can kind of see things. Um, and then there are separate scales oftentimes for the AC and DC voltage ranges because the, the meters react a little bit differently. So they'll typically be oftentimes uh, different. In this particular case, only the AC current range is different where AC and DC voltage is measured on the black, the black scales up here. The scales have got tick marks on them, okay? And typically you're gonna have 10 tick marks between the numbered major ticks, just to kind of make it easy to kind of figure out what you're reading. And you also have to take a little bit of care to look to be careful you're not getting any parallax error. Parallax error uh, happens if you're viewing the meter pointer from an angle instead of straight down onto the meter face because the meter pointer is sitting you know, a millimeter or two above the meter face. So if you look at it at an angle, it may look like that pointer is lined up to one tick, but it may really not be. 
And some meters actually have a mirrored scale on them, uh, kind of in, nestled in between all the numbers, so that if you're looking directly on it, the reflection of the backside of the pointer would be hidden by the pointer itself. So then you know you're viewing it straight on. Whereas in this case over here, you can see, I can see the reflection of the meter or the, the backside of the pointer and the pointer itself. And this tells me that I'm, I'd probably be reading a little bit of parallax error. And uh, the actual reading is really somewhere between those two marks. So you want to kind of align your view to hide that reflection underneath the meter pointer. And that's the whole reason there's a, meter, a mirrored scale on some of these uh, VOMs. A lot of VOMs will have special connections on them. You'll notice that this, you know, this old Simpson 260, one of my favorite VOMs, has got you know eight different connections on it. So it's not just a simple, you know, plus and minus. Uh, some of these connections will have their own functions and ranges. We'll take a look at that on the next slide. Um, generally, these are for higher current or higher voltage measurements. Uh, sometimes there might be special ranges or a special function like this guy right here. Does anybody know what that, that uh, terminal called output is used for? Well, what that's used for, it's actually a special AC coupled input for measuring AC voltage on top of something, on top of riding, riding on top maybe of a DC bias. This is uh, very commonly found on old tube equipment sometimes like the back end of a tube amplifier, you, you know, the, the output transformer sitting, you know, in the, the plate of the, uh, the plate circuit of the output tube, which may be riding at a couple of hundred volts, but you want to measure maybe the, just the AC wiggle on top of that. The output uh, input is what you would use on, uh, on the meter to reject the DC component and just measure the AC component. So that's just one example of kind of a, a special function that is on some meters. Now, let's take a look at how to use some of those special connections in the case of the Simpson 260, for example. So if you want to measure current on the 10 amp range, okay, you'll notice that there are actually two terminals, minus 10A and plus 10A. So you'd actually connect your two probes to those two terminals. And then in this case, you go on the, this scale right here. A lot of these special terminals um, the, they would use the lettering that is kind of in the smaller type. You can see this one says 10 milliamps in big type and then amps in small type. The, the amps in small type means that you're going to use that position when you're using the 10 amp scale. Now measuring something on the one volt range, because if you look at the major ranges here, I've got 500, 250, 50, 10, uh, two and a half and half a volt. But I've got a one volt range here in small type. So in order to do that, I would connect up to the common and the one volt terminal and put the meter switch position into that position. Okay. On the 50 microamp range, you kind of get the idea of where we're going here. Okay. So here's a 50 volt range, but it also says 50 microamps in small print. So I'd use the 50 microamp terminal and the common terminal and this switch position to measure 50 microamps. And then finally measuring on the 1000 volt range. Okay, and we use a 1000 volt range here, and then we've got the 1000 volt uh, in small type down here. Uh, so we we'll already kind of covered what the output terminal does. So this is how the Simpson 260 does it. You know, other meters might have a different way of indicating how you'd use the extra terminals that are there. But I just wanted to point this out because you, you know, may not have realized kind of how to use, you know, some of these extra inputs you know, to this meter. Now, something to th think about with volt ohm meters is the uh, loading considerations. Now, I just noticed there's a little bit of a chat here. I just want to pop into that to see if there's any questions here um, before we kind of move on. Let me see. Uh, let's see. Okay, not for me. I'll close that. <laughs> okay, so more on the uh, the loaded, loading considerations for a volt ohm meter. Uh, if we take a look at this text right here on the meter face, it says twenty thousand ohms per volt DC and five thousand ohms per volt AC. What does this mean? So is this an indication of the meter's sensitivity, or is it the input resistance of the meter in some sense? Or is it the meter's full-scale current rating, okay? Or 
Is it all of the above? Well, the answer really is it's all of the above. It's just different ways of specifying, you know, all, all of those things. And really what you do with that is you multiply the scale setting by that value to determine the meter's resistance and how much of a load it's going to place on your circuit. So if I, was, if I had the meter set to the 10 volt scale, that means that the meter would present a 200,000 ohms, right? 20,000 ohms times 10. It would present a 200 K ohm load to your circuit. So that's what that means. And then the AC loading would be just 50 K ohms. So some of the, some meters will have a sensitivity, if you will, or a rating as low as a thousand ohms per volt, especially on the AC rating. So you have to think about that. Depending on what kind of a circuit you're measuring, it might make a difference. I'll show you an example of that. Now, most what I would call good VOMs in air quotes are 20,000 20, ohms per volt or more. Okay. And that's kind of typical. Now, low values aren't always a bad thing, right? They might be a bad thing if they're going to load your circuit by, but there are some reasons why it might not be a bad thing. And the case in point here is if you're measuring AC voltage, like maybe AC line voltage, you know, coming from your outlet or something like that. Um, the meters are sensitive enough that the, the leads themselves, the probes, can actually pick up uh, and act as antennas, as well as the wiring in your wall. Even if you throw the breaker off, if that, that wiring in your wall is running near something else, it can kind of pick up kind of a straight voltage, kind of like an antenna. But it doesn't have any, you know, any strength behind it. It's just kind of a stray voltage. But the meter might show something. But if the meter has a relatively low input resistance, it'll drag that that kind of phantom voltage down and give you a real true reading of whether the, the breaker is thrown or not on that particular circuit. So in fact, the electricians use a an, a, a, an old uh, tester called a Wiggy, which actually had a solenoid in it to kind of load AC circuits. So you can actually hear when you connect it up to, to a live circuit or not, and it wouldn't kind of fool you by reading a phantom voltage. So and that's so there are some instances where a lower uh, input resistance is is okay, particularly when measuring AC. So for analog VOMs, my my thought is that you should always have one. All right, and now why is that? Well, they're pretty cheap these days. You can often find them in the box at the Hamfest underneath the table because nobody's selling them; they're just giving them away. Okay, so they're usually really cheap. They're generally pretty rugged, as long as you don't abuse them too badly. And the nice thing is I, I put in here with an asterisk, uh, no battery is required. And if you're not, generally, if you're not measuring resistance with one of these meters, you're just measuring voltage or current, you don't need batteries. So you don't have to worry about batteries leaking. You don't have to worry about batteries going dead. You can just pick up the meter. It's been sitting for 20 years and it's not going to have a problem. You just go ahead and use it. And they're really good. What I use them for a lot is when I'm monitoring or adjusting or tuning circuits and you're tuning for something, going, a voltage or current going up or down or peaking a response up or down. To me, it's a whole lot easier to watch an analog meter movement moving up or down than it is watching you know, numbers on a DMM or a segmented display. It's kind of why I like having analog meters on my, uh, my HF rigs. If you can see over my shoulder over there, just about all of my my rigs and my meters and stuff are all analog meters. I do have one that's got a digital meter, my old, uh, 870, but uh, everything else has got analog meters on it. So, and the other thing that what I like about VOMs is that they make you think, right? If you're working on electronics, having your brain engaged and thinking about what you're doing is a good thing. So that to me, that's another good reason to have an analog meter around because it, it kind of helps you keep your brain engaged. So it makes you think. Let me just check. There was one more thing in the chat here, and it looks like we're okay. Okay. So let's talk a bit about handheld DMMs. Uh, these are you know, kind of very common fluke uh, 79 meter, as well as uh, the meter that just about everybody has because Harbor Freight gives them away about once every couple of a couple of months. Now, most meters are th what are called three and a half digit. Now, what does that mean? What's three and a half digits? Basically, what that means is that three digits go from zero through nine, and then one digit is either a zero or a one. That's what, so it's not quite a half a digit, it's like a tenth of a digit, if you will, but, but that's what we call a three and a half digit meter. Okay. Some will have this digital bar graph. And, uh, you know, to me, I don't 
I don't really think that the digital bar graph is a substitute for an analog meter movement, because especially when you have auto range changes, I can kind of fool you. And certainly doesn't give you the granularity that a analog meter movement does, because that's kind of an infinite granularity as opposed to a segmented granularity. Now, some DMMs are geared a bit more for electrical or appliance work in terms of the voltage and current scales that are available on it. Some are really geared towards industrial and service work for higher voltage and higher currents, and others may be more geared towards electronics work. And those would typically be ones that have you know, lower current ratings. They, they might have extra features for measuring things like capacitance or frequency, for example. So a little bit more on the DMMs. Uh, in general, most DMMs have got a very high 10 mega ohm input impedance, kind of similar to the, the VTVMs of old. Okay. So, the, and that input impedance or that input resistance doesn't change with the scale like it does on the analog VOM. So the loading is going to be, you know, a lot lighter, if you will. Most of them are auto ranging, you know, like this one here, I would just set AC voltage or DC voltage and it auto ranges. But this other one that I've got over here, this uni T you can see has got manual range selections. And it's basically the same deal. You, you really want to set the range to something higher than what you expect to read. And then you can turn it down for more sensitivity if you discover that you're reading a voltage that's much lower than the scale you set. Now again, uh, so most have auto ranging, you just set the mode and that's it. And you just use this correct set of jacks and you're done, okay? They might have separate high and low ranges, okay? In this, in this case here, I just have a common that I've got a current, a low current, a high current, and then the other terminal for your volts and ohms and continuity and uh, diode test and things like that. Now, some again are not auto ranging. Uh, on the auto ranging units, you can turn the auto range off. And that, again, will be handy if you're going to be using the meter to um, you know, measure something that's varying from some low value to some high value. You may not want the range changing, so you can actually watch the bar graph and not have it jump around on you when it changes ranges. So there may be a good reason to turn the auto ranging off in particular circumstances. Uh, some of the meters will actually give you trend measurements. Um, and you could all, and all, well, so again, use, looking at those trend measurements with the auto ranging off can help. And then also when it comes to measuring current, the range that you set or that you get will determine the burden voltage. We'll talk a bit about that. Uh, so if you're, you're going to get a different burden for a given current, you get a different burden voltage as the current range changes. So by fixing the range and not letting it change, you will kind of fix that burden voltage as well. And there's also oftentimes a digital, you know, continuity beeper for measuring, just measuring whether something's connected or not. You know, DMMs will typically have that. And a lot of DMMs will have, again, will have some special functions. Uh, some of those that'll be handy for us when we're working on electronics and things like that is sometimes measuring frequency. Now, it's certainly not a, uh, substitute for an RF frequency counter. Typically, we're talking about measuring frequency in the audio range, you know, maybe up to you know a few kilohertz. In some cases, maybe a little bit higher, but really that's about it. Uh, some will have min and max tracking, so you can actually you know touch a button and see what the lowest and highest voltages that you measured were uh, when you went you know that you were looking at. Uh, oftentimes, you can do a quick diode test. And it'll put a, spe a specified or a specific current through a diode to measure the forward voltage. You can use that to do a rough you know, matching of diodes and that type of thing, or just check if a diode is good or not. Some can measure capacitance, not to the same level that a true LCR meter can, but you know, often you're not going to get down to measuring you know, single digit picofarads or something like that. But generally with moderate value capacitors, you can oftentimes measure capacitance with some of these meters. Some actually have temperature probes, and some can actually measure the current gain of bipolar transistors, okay, or the HFE or beta. And then some can, can also do delta or relative measurements where you uh, want to just look for a change. This is often very handy when you're measuring very, very low values of resistance. You want to zero out the resistance of the probes themselves so that you can measure that small value of resistance that's connected at the end of the probes. Now, bench DMMs are really just the handheld DMMs on steroids. 
but generally much higher resolution, typically five and a half to eight and a half digits of resolution. Okay. Uh, generally have much higher accuracy instead of a few percent, they might be, you know, a few tenths of a percent or less in terms of accuracy. Uh, so that's, that's a good thing. Many times they'll often support four wire measurements. And this is handy again for, for low resistance measurements. What it does is it, it forces the current, the test current through the main measurement probes, but then measures the voltage across the device of this low resistance device you're testing with a separate set of probes so that um, you don't have any of the effect of the resistance of your test leads. Uh, oftentimes these meters can also do things like data logging to record values over time, can include filtering and averaging, and sometimes other special functions. Uh, for example, this uh, Keithy 2015 THD can measure total harmonic distortion on a, like a one kilohertz audio tone. Uh, can also measure synad and things like that. So it takes the place of the old, uh, you know, synad meters and stuff. If you're, if you're trying to, you know, do an alignment on an FM radio, for example. Uh, a couple of practical tips on both VOMs and DMMs. And again, one we the one we mentioned earlier is loading. So you have to think about, you know, the the meter itself is looking like a resistor. You know, in the case of let's say I had this thing set to, you know, say this twenty five volt scale, twenty thousand ohms per volt, that's going to look something like on, on the order of a half a mega ohm. But if you stick that across these two points of the circuit, that resistor is one mega ohm. Well, gee, now all of a sudden that one mega ohm resistor is in parallel with this half a mega ohm that I've got from the meter, and the circuit's going to behave quite differently because I've now changed the resistor that's in there. Okay, so again, the on the VOMs, the resistance presented by the meter to your circuit depends on the range, the voltage range you have set. On the DMM, that's typically just ten mega ohms. Okay, so you have, you don't have to worry about it generally too much. Now, the other one that's, that you have to kind of think about is, I mentioned earlier, is the ammeter burden voltage. Because these meters all measure current by essentially letting that current go through an internal small value resistor and then measuring the voltage across that resistor. So uh, depending on what range you set, that determines what that resistor value is going to be. It's basically a shunt resistor in parallel with the meter. So the higher current ratings will have a lower resistance value. So the voltage that appears across the meter when you stick it in series to measure current is going to be lower when you have a, you know, a higher uh, range setting. So it's not going to be zero. You have to think about whenever you're measuring current, you're going to introduce some voltage drop called the burden voltage across the meter. The higher the range, the lower the resistance, and therefore the lower the burden voltage. And again, as I mentioned, when you're measuring AC, uh, if you're measuring just AC voltage with any of, the, any of these meters, uh, they're typically rated for audio frequencies only. You can't measure RF amplitude, RF, RF frequency, amp or radio frequency signal amplitude. You're typically looking at audio signals or maybe tens of kilohertz at the most. Anything above that, uh, the meter's not going to display accurately. The other thing to measure, remember too, is that the vast majority of the meters, both analog and digital, are not what we call true RMS meters, true RMS reading meters, meaning that they're only gonna give you an accurate RMS voltage reading if the signal you're measuring is sinusoidal. Uh, there are some, you know, there are more and more digital multimeters available that are what are called true RMS meters, which will actually measure the actual RMS voltage for non-sinusoidal signals. So again, it's just something to remember and think about. Uh, if you're just measuring line voltage coming out of your power, you know, out of your wall socket or looking at the voltage coming out of a, a transformer and a power supply, that's all sinusoidal, it's no big deal. But if you're looking at anything that's non-sinusoidal, you know, pulses out of a microcontroller or even audio signals and things like that, um, oftentimes you're not going to get a accurate RMS reading, but it may be close enough for what you're trying to do. So let's summarize a little bit about uh, on VOMs. I kind of view the analog VOM as your slide roll, right? And the digital multimeter as the calculator, okay? The analog VOM is really great for looking at trends and peaks and dips and just watching how things are changing over time, whether they're quickly or slowly, that type of thing. Plus, you also get some 
what I call mechanic, mechanical averaging, right? Because the, the meter itself has got some inertia. So if you got something that's varying and wiggling around with noise, that'll kind of get averaged out within the meter movement itself, where it might drive the digits nuts on a, a digital multimeter. Okay, so you get that mechanical averaging capability. And again, no battery is necessary except for measuring resistance for the most part. So uh, that can be nice because you don't, again, you don't have to worry about the batteries going bad and you know rotting out the insides of your meter when they leak. And they're gen generally pretty inexpensive. And as I mentioned, they make you think, right, when you use them and when you're working on electronics, that's always a good thing. Now, the digital multimeters really are going to give you much better accuracy and better resolution than an analog meter will. So that's your choice when you, when that's important to you. They're simple to use. So, you know, set the range, plug it in, good to go, right? You don't have to think about it so much, but you really, you, know, you just have to remember that you, know, you still have to put thought into what you're doing. Most are auto ranging, so you don't have to even worry about the range that you're putting it on. And oftentimes you get some of these additional handy functions that uh, you don't have on an analog VOM. So in my mind, there's really room for both of these, you know, in your ham shack. And I've got several of each because I, and I use them all the time. So maybe before we uh, switch gears on, a sc on scopes, just wondering if there was open it up for any questions on, on meters in general, and then we can kind of move on to scopes. All right, hearing nothing. If you again, I'm a I'm a big fan of the Simpson 260. I've got a couple of videos on that uh, analog VOM on my channel. So there's a number of different series that have been produced for the better part of 60 or 70 years, and uh, so it's a really really great analog meter. If you're ever going going to get just one, that would be the one to get. So let's kind of switch gears and talk a bit about oscilloscopes, both analog and digital. So we'll start off a bit maybe with the summary. You know, analog scopes generally pretty inexpensive. So I kind of light that up in green here. The digital scopes can be relatively expensive, although new ones these days you can get for in the you know two to three hundred dollar range for the for the kind of the real the inexpensive kind of type. There's some really really inexpensive ones sub a hundred dollars that are really not good for anything much more than audio. But if you're looking for something that's got you know, 50 or 100 megahertz of bandwidth, you can, you can spend in the neighborhood of $300 for a new one with these days, which actually isn't too bad. But the analog scopes you might be able to pick up for a fraction of that at a ham fest. And the nice thing about the analog scopes is like instant response, right? It's a direct connection, if you will, you know, just through some electronics and amplifiers between what you're probing and what gets deflected on the scope screen. So, and any changes just are instantaneous because you're not making any changes to an acquisition system. You're just making changes to what's driving the beam on the scope. So some digital scopes, they may feel nice and snappy, but they'll generally have some little bit of a lag, especially if you did side by side and adjusting controls between the analog and digital scope side by side. The analog scopes are really great when you're looking at RF envelopes, right? You think of the old station monitors like the, S the, the Kenwood SM220 or um, the Heath kit was at the Y01 or whatever. That's what I thought. That's, what I, that's the ASU, I guess. But um, the, the analog scopes are really great for looking at RF envelopes because they you don't, you don't have to worry about things like aliasing and things like that. So really, still still the best choice for looking at like modulated RF envelopes of like an AM or single sideband transmitter or PSK31 or something like that. Whereas on digital scopes, the RF envelopes can be tricky because the digital scopes are digitizing the signal, displaying the sample data on the screen. And if you adjust the scope so that you see the envelope where you can actually see you know, syllables of your words, the sample rate is generally going to be low enough that you're going to start undersampling the RF. So things kind of get a little tricky. So you start cranking a sample rate or memory up to get back, and then, then things get slow and it isn't really good anymore. You don't have to worry about any of that within an analog scope with looking at RF envelopes. Now, of course, the digital scopes can store and freeze waveforms, so you can look at them and study them and make measurements and things like that. You really can't do that on the analog scopes, right? You really don't have any storage on them. And I put this in yellow because there are analog scopes that had some storage capability within the phosphor, you know, and uh, and but they were a little bit tricky to use and they bloom out a little bit and they don't work nearly as well as storing waveforms on a digital scope. Now the digital scopes will also give you automatic measurements uh, and you know 
you don't have to you don't have to start counting divisions to measure things. For example, you just get make measurements automatically. And it was only some of the latest generation of analog scopes before digital took over that actually did some of that. So for the most part, you don't really have any automatic measurements with the analog scopes. Some of the kind of the more premium ones would have things like cursors and that type of stuff, and that can help. Now, digital scopes will also have an auto set button. I put the auto set button in green, but I also, being a, a scope guy, I also call the auto set button the wimp button, right? If you don't know how to drive, you know, you hit the wimp button, but in my mind, you're better off learning how to use it and not, not rely on that wimp button to set the scope up. Now, the analog scopes don't have an auto set. So again, they make you think. There's maybe sensing a little bit of a theme here. It was having to think about how you use something and how you test something is always a good thing. So that's another nice reason to have some analog scopes around. So let's take a, a little bit deeper look at the cathode ray oscilloscope, or the analog scopes first. Uh, basically, the, the central item in it is essentially a vacuum tube, uh, a, a CRT, cathode ray tube, that shoots an electron beam out, and that beam gets deflected horizontally and vertically by the scope circuits and, and traces out a waveform on the phosphor that, that glows, and that's what you're re actually looking at. It's really kind of a graphical voltmeter. So kind of block diagram-wise, you've got horizontal and vertical deflection amplifiers that move the beam up or down and back and forth and power supply and some, some other circuitry in there. And the display itself has got graticle lines on it, kind of like the scales on an analog meter, typically 10 by 10 or 10 by 8 in terms of graticles. And the, the minor divisions are often just five divisions between the major divisions. The major divisions are the ones when we start talking about setting the scale to one volt per division or two volts per division. We're talking about these major divisions, not the little minor tick marks. So the display system uh, is really the very basic controls to set up the display itself. And that's these controls right here. The intensity control is the, the, the brightness of the trace. The focus control is obvious. The trace rotation is typically necessary because the deflection is actually a magnetic, electronic controlled magnetic deflection. And depending on the Earth's magnetic field or any other magnetic fields that are on the bench where you've got this thing might cause the trace to be tilted one way or the other or off of the central axis. So you may have to, for the, the given position of the scope in your lab or your bench or your shack, you might have to play with the trace rotation to get that trace to be flat you know, with respect to the screen radical. Again, depending on the scope, those controls will be, you know, maybe illumination instead of intensity, depending on the scope. The beam finder is a push button, just a, sing a single momentary push button that momentarily decreases the amount of deflection offered by the horizontal and vertical section. It kind of collapses the waveform onto the screen. Because oftentimes, if you're looking at a, at, a, at a scoop and I don't see any waveform at all, it's possible that you know, you've got too much voltage going in and the waveform is kind of off the top of the screen or down below the bottom of the screen or something. The beam find will help you see if there is a waveform that's above or below or left or right of the screen. That's kind of what that's useful for. It's kind of like a fish finder. <laughs> Now the vertical system on the scope is really the measurement system. This is, we're applying the input signal to the vertical system of the scope. Uh, and then it basically is going through an input attenuator, an input preamp, and then ultimately going into an amplifier that's driving the vertical deflection plates. It's what moves the beam up or down. Apply a positive voltage, the beam goes up, a negative voltage, the beam goes down. Okay, there's other controls here we'll talk about here in a moment, okay. Now you'll notice that we, we have an attenuator and a preamp. And the reason for that is the way that the, it's a lot easier to design an amplifier with a fixed gain and fixed characteristics in terms of frequency response and things like that, as opposed to adjusting something that's got variable gain and maintaining a nice flat frequency response. So the way the vertical system of most analog scopes are designed is to have a fixed gain preamp and final amplifier and then a simply a variable passive attenuator that you're adjusting when you're adjusting the scale to, in order to adjust the scale appropriately on the screen. So you're really adjusting the level going into the amplifier chain, not adjusting the amplifier gain itself. So that's why you'll often sometimes we'll see the vertical control be called an attenuator as opposed to vertical scale. <laughs> 
but that's kind of what sets the volts per division scale that you're going to have. So let's talk a little bit about scale and coupling. Uh, it's the volts per division setting that is also, again, called the vertical attenuator or vertical scale control. You can see it, in this case, it says volts per div, volts per div over here. And you can kind of see you know, what that is. And again, that, that refers to volt, how many, what voltage it takes to move the beam one major, one major radical line. Okay. Now, if you've got a scope that has got these controls on it, where you have vertical input times one times 10 times 100, and then an analog vernier control, this is an uncalibrated scenario. Okay. Whereas these guys are calibrated scenarios. And generally, in order to keep them calibrated, you have, you, there's a, a variable knob that generally is turned to, into a detent. These guys are uncalibrated entirely. There's almost no reason to be using a scope like this anymore because you can find properly calibrated lab-grade scopes pretty inexpensively. So there's no excuse for using you know, the, the older uncalibrated units anymore. So I, I put the big X through that. Now, on a scope, the selection of AC or DC on the input is not does not refer to the type of signal you're measuring, unlike a VOM or a DMM, right? In a VOM or DMM, you you set you set it to AC or DC to measure DC voltage or AC voltage. That's not what the AC or DC control is on a scope, and it's called a coupling control. It basically says how I'm going to pass the signal from the input to the amplifiers. If you set it to AC, then there's basically you're just throwing a capacitor in series with the measurement path. So that you're, it's kind of like that output terminal that we talked about initially on the on the Simpson 260. It basically will reject the DC content of a signal, only let the AC component go through. Where DC where DC coupling is going to allow both the AC and DC content of the signal to make it onto the scope screen. So here's an example. If I'm trying to measure this small, maybe we'll call this a ripple on top of a power supply. Maybe my ground reference is here. And my, my my power supply DC voltage is coming up to here. I've got a little bit of ripple on it. If I want to expand that to look at it, I might start changing my volts per division setting, but that's going to cause this volt, this signal to go up above the screen. And I might try to turn the position down to bring it in, but I might run out of range on the position control to make that happen. So if I AC couple this, this measurement on the power supply rail, I'll reject the DC component, and then I can adjust the scale to more accurately measure the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of um, this wiggle on top of the DC or the ripple on top of the DC. So it's actually interesting that oftentimes you might you would use AC coupling when looking at DC voltages like power supply rails, but you might use DC coupling when you're looking at AC signals going through, say, an amplifier. If you got an amplifier that's distorting, for example, or clipping, it's helpful to look through that amplifier chain using DC coupling, because then you can kind of see, well, okay, I can see that my signal level is going down deep enough to saturate a transistor. Without being DC coupled, you wouldn't see that, right? So, uh, so it's funny that you know, AC signals through an amplifier, you often use DC coupling, and looking at ripple on DC so DC signals, you use AC coupling. So just think about that. This is really a coupling mechanism, not a mode. Also note that the scope will indicate on, on the screen what the input impedance is. And in the vast majority of cases, the input impedance to the scope is one mega ohm. So it's a little bit, it's lower than a DMM, but generally higher than a VOM. And then higher speed scopes will also have a selection option to go from one mega ohm to 50 ohms for RF applications. But also take a note that on the one mega ohm, they'll generally also tell you what the input capacitance is. So you'll know what the capacitive loading of the input is. And this will be important later when we start talking about probes. So let's talk a bit more about vertical because then this is the controls you're using the most. Uh, vertical modes. And again, you can see I've got a couple of different scope front panels here where in this case I could see mode has got, you know, in this case a four channel scope. I've got a couple of other modes here. I've got a couple of modes on a selection switch over here on this scope. So you can select what channels you want turned on. And then you have uh, an alt or chop control. Uh, most of these scopes, these analog scopes have got just a single beam that's swept across the screen. So how do you display two channels worth of signal? So in the alt mode, Okay, in that case, it's you can see Alt is right here, or Alt is the out position of this button. 
In alt mode, what happens is that every other sweep is switched between channel one and channel two, for example. So I'll, I'll do a sweep for channel one, a sweep for channel two. And generally the sweep is fast enough that you can't really see that that's going on, you, that you're ping-ponging back and forth between them. And it just looks like two traces. But there are instances, if you're looking at relatively slow sweep speeds where the beam is just going across the screen, the screen slowly, in the alt mode, you'd actually see one channel, then you'd see the other, then you'd see the first, then you'd see the second. That's where you'd use the chop mode. The chop mode internally flips back and forth between the two channels rapidly, okay? So that even in very slow sweep speeds, it still looks like you have two traces. So that's why we have a difference between alt and chop. And it really comes down to what ultimately you got set up in terms of sweep speed, how fast the beam is moving across the screen to determine which of the two is gonna work out best for you. There's also an add mode where in this case, I can see I can add channel one to channel two. Okay, I've got an add mode over here as well. And you say, well, add, that isn't very useful. Why would I want to add two signals? Really where add comes in handy is when you add it, when you use it in combination with the invert function. Okay, so if I take channel one on one end of the resistor, for example, and put channel two on the other end of a resistor and I invert that and then add them, is it, that's the same thing as subtracting those two. So that allows me to make a differential voltage measurement or a voltage difference measurement across a component. Okay, because that's something easy to do with a, uh, a meter. You can just put the two probes on there. But on a, a, on a scope, we'll talk a little bit about this later, is that you can't just take the two ends of a probe and plop them anywhere on the circuit. One side of that probe is always ground. So in order to make measurements across a component, you'd often use this kind of pseudo differential measurement technique where you do an add and invert. So now the other piece, major piece or system in the scope is the horizontal system, right? The vertical system controls how the beam is moved up or down, sensitivity, coupling, et cetera. The horizontal system determines how we move the beam across the screen to trace out the waveforms. Generally, this is not uh, an input signal, but it's really kind of done all internally with a sweep generator. The sweep generator basically creates a ramp voltage that moves that beam across the screen. And you set up you know, how fast, or how many seconds per it's going to take to go each division across the screen. And oftentimes that's milliseconds or microseconds or even faster. Okay. So again, oftentimes it's called the sweep control or time-based control. On the digital scopes, it's called horizontal scale because there is no sweeping effectively on a, on a, anal a digital scope. But on the analog scopes, again, it's, it's basically this ramped waveform that basically is driving the beam from one end of the screen to the other. The, the, the older scopes, these kind of the ones I told you there's no excuse using anymore, you can kind of tell that the, what, these are called recurrent sweep scopes. And that horizontal drive waveform is essentially a continuous sawtooth wave. And you adjust essentially the range and then an analog vernier control to adjust the frequency of that wave. That wave. The sweep just runs continuously. And there's a sync control to try to help lock your signal to that sweep rate, but it doesn't work really well. But this is the way the old, these old recurrent sweep scopes worked. And again, uncalibrated in terms of horizontal scale. So you really can't accurately measure things like frequency and, unless you do some other techniques like X, Y, and things like that. So, and it's just, again, just older and simpler technology. So, but again, so many lab grade calibrated horizontal scale scopes are available that you really want to look for a triggered sweep scope, you know, if you're going to go find something. And generally you can tell it's a triggered sweep scope where, you, where you're going to have a calibrated sweep time per division. Uh, the sweep runs when it gets a trigger. So basically you're kind of sitting there, you don't really see the beam at all until the trigger happens. And then the trigger kind of kicks the sweep across and then it waits again for the next trigger and then sweeps again. And again, you get this calibrated sweep time. So you can measure things like rise time or propagation delay or frequency or things like that because you now have got a, a calibrated time scale horizontally. And again, these are gonna be the more powerful, more flexible ones. So again, if you're looking at scopes under the benches at the ham fest, these, you know, these uh, coming weeks, look for one that's got you know, trigger and a calibrated horizontal sweep. So triggering, as I kind of alluded to, is what kicks off the waveform, this, this, this sweep across the screen. 
And ideally what it does is it, it stabilizes the waveform on the screen. So let's say I've got a waveform that looks kind of like this. If we kick off the sweep at the same location in the waveform each time, then each sweep is going to overlay on top of each other and you're getting to get a nice stable waveform. So again, those older scopes with the sync control would, would basically take a piece of the input signal and try to injection lock the horizontal oscillator to it. And uh, don't, it's all that kind of worked and it didn't work really well. Again, stay away from those guys and go with ones that actually have got proper trigger controls. And you'll see things like trigger coupling, you'll see you know, a trigger slope, a trigger level, you know, much, much more powerful and much easier and, and you get much nicer results out of the trigger sweep scopes. So let's talk about some of the trigger controls. These are some of the ones that, that cause people the most consternation because it's a confusing topic. So what are we gonna use as a source to initiate that trigger. The, an internal source means that I'm gonna grab that trigger from some internal circuitry, and typically that's coming from the vertical signal itself. So I'm gonna take that vertical signal, that's what's gonna drive the waveform up or down, but I'm also gonna apply that to the trigger engine so that the trigger engine can, with its controls, determine at what position on that waveform do I wanna start the sweep. So that's what the internal trigger is. Oftentimes the scopes will have a selection for external trigger and, and that's just another signal that you'd bring in to kick off the sweep. And ideally that would be in some way synchronous to the input signal that you're trying to measure. And also the scopes will often have a selection for line. And what that means is that the trigger circuit is gonna work off the 60 Hertz line voltage that is plugged into in the wall. You might say, well, why do I wanna do that? Well, if you're trying to trace down uh, a hum problem, okay? because of bad, bad power supply filtering or something like that. The, you know, that hum is gonna be related to the line frequency of the AC, the AC voltage coming out of your wall. So by setting the scope to trigger on the line, you're already gonna be synchronous to and get a stable waveform for any hum that you're trying to track down and measure within your circuits. Now there are trigger modes. Um, there's an auto trigger mode, which is not exactly what you think it is. We'll talk about that on the next slide or two. Normal trigger mode is basically, you know, saying that when I get a trigger, I kick off the sweep. If I don't get a trigger, I don't get a sweep at all. Okay. Single trigger mode means that I'm going to set up my trigger. When I get a trigger, I get a sweep, and then I won't trigger and sweep again until I reset it. Not really that useful on an analog scope unless you've got a camera or something like that to capture the event. And then some of the scopes actually have TV triggering to trigger on the vertical and horizontal scan lines of the old analog TVs. So there's a lot more trigger modes available on digital scopes. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And then trigger coupling, very similar to the coupling on the vertical section that we talked about, AC and DC coupling to either accept or reject the DC content of the signal. But oftentimes there's additional uh, coupling like HF reject or high frequency reject to maybe to depress any high frequency noise on the signal and only trigger on the slowly varying portion of it. That's what that would be. Okay. Now auto triggering, again, it's not what you think. It's not the, it's not the auto set button, okay? Auto triggering does not automatically set up your trigger settings for you, okay? What auto triggering is, is a usability aid and it prevents a blank screen, right? Because the normal trigger is means that I'm only gonna get a sweep when the scope is properly triggered. So if I don't have my, tr don't have my trigger control set properly, I don't get anything on my display. So that's not really useful. It doesn't really tell me much. So what auto triggering does is, is the scope waits for a trigger event to happen. If that trigger event doesn't happen, meaning if your input signal doesn't meet, doesn't or your trigger settings are not met by the input signal or vice versa, the scope is just going to self-trigger. It's going to wait 50 to 100 milliseconds and then just self-trigger. So you'll at least get a trace on the screen. You can see what's going on. And, and that would oftentimes give you enough information to say, well, now, now I'll just adjust my trigger until my display gets stable. So again, it puts that trace on the, on the scope even when a trigger isn't satisfied so you can see what's happening. So if your trace is rolling or unsynchronized or wiggling back and forth, it could be that you're seeing, you're seeing auto-triggered sweeps and that your trigger settings aren't being satisfied by your signal at that point. So you might wanna make some tweaks to trigger level and that type of thing. So tr auto-triggering is helpful, 
It's a visual aid, but it isn't automatically setting up the trigger for you. So what are the trigger level and slope? And what they are is the, the allow you to trigger on when the your input signal is rising through a threshold level or falling through a, th a threshold level. And that's the, what the slope control does. So in this case, I can see my level is turned up something a little bit positive, okay, a little bit above the center line. And my slope here is positive, which means that I can see the level is here and I'm triggering when this signal goes from below it to crossing above it. So that's a positive trigger slope. The negative trigger slope is when my signal is coming back down through that threshold. So that's what the positive and negative trigger, the slope is. And then here's the same thing now with the level control turned down below zero. So now the, the same triggering is happening, but now below baseline. Okay. So again, positive slope and negative slope. So those are the most common controls for doing what are what we call an edge trigger, triggering on the edge of a signal, whether it's a rising edge or a falling edge, and then at what voltage threshold it's crossing through. So that's your, th your trigger level and trigger slope. So with that, let's kind of talk about now the differences between the analog scopes that we just talked about and the new generation, the digital scopes. Now, the front end of a digital scope is often very similar to the front end of the vertical section of an analog scope, input attenuator, input preamp, you know, that type of thing. So it's the same basic front end that's there. But what happens then is that instead of going in and driving the vertical plates or vertical amplifier, uh, the input is goes into an analog to digital converter and gets sampled. Basically, we're taking snapshots of the voltage over time and storing them into acquisition memory. And then all the processing is done on that sampled data. So I'm sampling the signals. Those samples are sent as, as you know, pictures, if you will, or, or sample points saying voltage is this, voltage is this, voltage is this. Processing that data, sticking that into memory, and then processing those things and drawing a picture by connecting the dots. Okay, so that's really what's kind of going on. The trigger system is looking at that same data and the trigger system in this case doesn't kick off any of the processing. It really is just a marker saying, okay, when I satisfy the trigger, I want, to, I want that position in time to be located at that position in time on the display. But the reality is that the acquisition system is always sampling all the time. And it's only how we're displaying and where we're going to align that display horizontally based on what you set up for the trigger. So let's talk a little bit about sample rate and memory depth. If we go back to that previous slide, we can kind of see that, you know, how quickly we take samples, okay, is we can see is a sample interval. One over that sample interval is the sample rate. Okay. So the sample rate, the memory depth, and the horizontal scale are all related, right? So the horizontal scale, you know, what I've got, I've got set, it's set to say, you know, 10 microseconds of division. I've got 10 divisions. That will mean I've got 100 microseconds of total display. And then my sample rate will determine how many samples I'm going to fit within that 100 microseconds. Okay, so if I, if I change my record length, you know, if I change my horizontal scale to something longer, like a millisecond, then at that same sample rate, I'm going to have to have many, many more samples of into memory. So it really is just a simple equation that my sample rate multiplied by the acquisition length tells me how much memory I need to have. Okay. You can kind of start to see the problem when you're looking at RF signals now. If I want to look at RF, like the RF envelope, I might have to have the horizontal scale set to a millisecond or so, so I can kind of see the variances of my voice on a single sideband signal. But if I'm looking at a signal that's set, say, 20 meters at 14 megahertz, I'd have to sample that at something faster than 14 megahertz, okay? So I might have to sample it at, at 100 mega sample per second or 50 mega sample per second. If I'm doing that for a millisecond, I'm talking about lots and lots of memory. Okay, so now once I acquire, even though the scope can sample maybe at a couple of hundred mega samples per second or even a couple of giga samples per second, um, oftentimes you're not going to be displaying all of those points on the screen, right? Because the, the screen on a, on a digital scope is really nothing more than a, like a computer display. So it's got a certain number of pixels available. So I might have a lot more points in memory than I can possibly display on the pixels, right? I might only, you know, so 
what the scopes will generally do is process all the waveform samples that are in memory onto the display. And oftentimes they'll do it by saying, well, if I if I look at like these kind of vertical bars here as my my pixel you know, columns, I'm going to take all of the sample points that are in memory and then basically put all those guys on top of each other and make myself kind of a co an, an intensity graded pixel. Okay, that will will kind of show me the kind of the central point and then the range of all the samples that are feeding into that one display point. So most modern scopes will do some kind of an intensity grading, which kind of emulates what happens on the phosphor on the old analog scopes. Now, there are some digital scope advantages. Uh, one is that we can do a single shot, you know, a single capture and zoom in on a waveform. So that might imply like a single shot capture to capture and examine a glitch of what's going on. Uh, you could also get pre-trigger information. You know, again, on the analog scope, the trigger kicks off the sweep. So you can't see what led up to the trigger event. You only see what happened after it. But on the digital scopes, the trigger is just effectively a marker saying, I want to trigger, I want, I want to trigger when the, my voltage crosses this level. Okay. But I want to position that, you know, maybe at this point on the screen instead of at the beginning. So I can see pre-trigger information that happened before my trigger event happened and then see what happened after it. It's not something that's very easy to do on an analog scope, but it's easy to do on a digital scope. Also, digital scopes have got many, many different trigger types. Uh, here's an example of, you know, they, of looking at a serial bus. And you know it could be an SPI bus or an RS-232 serial signal or whatever it might be. A lot of these scopes can actually decode the data and even trigger on the data. So if you're if you are an experimenter and you like like playing around with Arduinos and you're talking with sensors over you know an SPI bus, you can actually probe that bus, decode it, maybe trigger. Hey, I want to I want to see whenever I probe my sensor, you know, with this address, I want to see what's going on. You can tell the scope to trigger on that address and then probe the other signals and get everything all at the same time. And also the digital scopes will give you these automatic measurements, min and max and peak and frequency and rise time and fall time, et cetera. Depending on the scope, you could have you know dozens and dozens of different automatic measurements that are available to you. So more digital scope features. Uh, oftentimes you have waveform math. We have some rudimentary math on the analog scopes, right? An invert function, an add function, a, a pseudo subtraction function by doing both. But oftentimes on the digital scopes, you have more extensive math capability. You can do addition and multiplication. You can have other math capability. I think this picture is actually from a video that I did where I was actually looking at the uh, switching characteristics of bipolar transistors. And you'll notice if you can, I don't know if you can read this or not, but this, the text that I've got here says the is basically says I base, which is base current. And what I was doing was probing the voltage on either side of a resistor in series with the base of the transistor. And then in math, taking this, the difference of those two voltages divided by the resistor value. So this is actually plotting the base current just by doing math, okay, on the scope. You also can do fast Fourier transforms. So there's kind of like basic spectrum analysis. Uh, I can look at the analog signal. I can look at the frequency content of that signal, okay, using the FFT. And there's many, many other advanced processing features for doing things like averaging and peak holds and min holds and envelope measurements and things like that. So a lot of other processing features that you get uh, on the digital scopes. Now, of course, there are some disadvantages with digital scopes. Uh, they can appear noisy. What I mean by that is because the digital scope is seeing everything and storing all these samples, even if you have these infrequent little excursions of noise, they're going to be visible on the scope. On an analog scope, uh, where the intensity of the trace is, is really governed by how many times the sweeps overlap that. So if you have an infrequent little burst of noise, it may not occur often enough to light up the phosphor for you to see. So the analog scopes look quieter, So, uh, but they really aren't. Now, analog uh, digital scopes, one of the biggest disadvantages is something called aliasing. And this is when the waveform sample rate is too slow to measure the signal. And the, the analogy that I use is the wagon wheel analogy. So if you ever watch an old Western movie on TV, 
Sometimes you see the wagons being dragged across the desert and it looks like the wagon wheels are going backwards, right? And that's because the frame rate of the video camera, you know, the, the motion picture camera that was taking it, it was taking snapshots, okay? And those snapshots were occurring at certain wheel positions and at certain speeds, it, it, you essentially, would, the wheel position would look like it was going backwards. And it's because it's undersampling the actual speed of the wheel. So you get this kind of... <laughs> you know, lying, if you will, it's called uh, aliasing of what the actual signal was doing. The same thing can happen with a, a digital scope. In this case, the red signal is the actual signal we've got going on. But if the scope is set up improperly and the sample rate is much lower, like the samples are the green dots, you can see I'm, I'm not sampling many samples along the waveform itself. I'm sampling, you know, just a point on every, every cycle or so. And if I stitch those signals together, it looks like the waveform is the blue line, but the actual waveform is the red one. So this can happen on digital scopes. Again, it's called aliasing. And it's something that will often happen when you're trying to look at RF envelopes on a digital scope. Oftentimes, if you're looking at a digital scope and you know you're properly triggered, but you're still seeing kind of this jumbly walking around waveform, it probably means that you're aliasing. That's kind of what it will look like on the scope. The update rate can be slow, particularly how, you know, if you've got a lot of memory dialed in uh, so you can keep the sample rate up, the update rate can be slow. And again, they can be pricey. You know, I mentioned you know, some of the entry level digital scopes can be had for a couple of hundred dollars. That, that's still pretty pricey. You know, I work in an industry where some digital high, ultra high speed digital scopes are several hundred thousand dollars. So the, but that's not going to be in the hands of any of us hobbyists. And uh, they also have lousy, what I call, what, what's called XY mode operation. XY mode is something where the vertical scale, the Y scale, Y axis is driven by the input signal like you normally would have, but the X axis is also driven by an external signal. There's a couple of interesting applications for this. And it works, they work really well on the old uh, digital scopes, or excuse me, analog scopes, but they don't work so well on the digital scopes. So let's kind of shift gears a little bit and talk about probes. Hang on a sec. <clears throat> so why do we use probes? Well, we've got to get our signal into the scope somehow. And probes can also be helpful to minimize the loading uh, that you're going to present on the circuit by looking at it. There are most, uh, the vast majority of the probe types that we have are passive probes, and they're either of the 1X or 10X variety, and most often actually the 10X variety. We'll talk about them in a minute. But there's also other probes available like active probes for doing things like differential measurements or, or very low loading with active FET probes and that type of thing, as well as current probes, high voltage probes, and others. Again, I wanna draw the distinction of probes on a DMM versus probes on a scope. Right on a DMM, you can plop those probe points down anywhere you want in your circuit. Right, one to the other, one to another. And you're measuring the voltage between those two points. Fully differential, fully floating, no problem at all. On an oscilloscope, it's not the case. On the oscilloscope, these probes are not like the DMM probes. One end of the probe, this guy right here, is connected to ground. It's connected to ground, the same ground that is the third, the third prong on your AC line voltage. And all of your other equipment and everything else that's grounded, that's at the same potential. So I can't just clip this, this alligator clip anywhere I want in the circuit because it's going to short that point to ground if it wasn't ground to begin with. Okay, So you're generally only measuring voltages with respect to ground with a scope. And that's why we have that pseudo differential measurement that we mentioned earlier. So again, something very important to remember is that this is not the same as using a DMM and probes like that. So let's talk about these 1X and 10X passive probes. A 1X probe is really nothing more than an extension of the probe input to some convenient point. It's really just a direct connection to the scope input. You have to remember though that, remember the scope is gonna have some amount of capacitance, input capacitance, typically 15 to 20 picofarads. The probe lead itself is going to add to that. So it's not uncommon for a 1x probe, even though it might look like a 1 megohm input resistance, it might also look like 100 picofarads of capacitive loading. And depending on the circuit that you're looking at, 
that can might affect that circuit. You know, if that circuit doesn't like having a one a hundred picofarad capacitance connected to where you're measuring, it can affect its operation. Particularly looking at IF or RF signals. Generally, audio signals you get away with it, but anything higher than that, um, higher frequency than that, the capacitor loading might bother you. So this is where ten x probes come in. Ten x probes. Uh, basically are like a 1x probe, except that at the very end, right near the probe tip, is a 9 megohm series resistor. So what that does is it puts all that capacitive loading on the other side of a 9 megohm resistor so that your circuit really doesn't see it. But because it's a 9 megohm resistor and your scope input is 1 megohm, that gives you a 10 to 1 voltage divider. So the voltage is actually cut down by a factor of 10, hence the, the name 10x. Um, before it gets to the scope. The 10x comes from the fact that whatever scale you set the scope up to, if I set it to one volt for division and I connect up a 10x probe, it'll actually be a 10 volt per division range. So that's where the 10x comes from. It multiplies the voltage scale range. So the good thing is that it reduces the effect of the capacitive loading. So now look, instead of looking like a 1 meg ohm and 100 picofarad, it'll look like basically 10 meg ohms and maybe 10 picofarads, okay? So that's a good thing. The bad thing is that you need to compensate this. And uh, I'm gonna talk a bit more about that. So here's a simple schematic of a 10X probe. There's my ground clip, there's my probe tip, there's the nine meg ohm resistor, there's the scope input that's one meg ohm, and that's got some capacitance. Now, if we ignored this guy right here, right? The series resistor forms a RC filter, a low pass filter with the input capacitance of the scope, right? At, very, at DC and very low, very low frequencies, you have this nice resistive 10x voltage divider. But as the frequency goes up, eventually this capacitive reactant starts looking smaller than, the, than this one mega ohm, and you get a low pass filter. So it attenuates the high frequencies. Well, that's not good. So what we do is we put in parallel with the nine mega ohm resistor, another capacitor. And uh, what we do is we adjust that capacitor value so that it has a 10 to one ratio with the input capacitance of the scope. So that now you get a nice flat frequency response. So at DC and low frequencies, that 10 X ratio is driven by the resistors. At higher frequencies, that 10 X divider is a capacitive voltage divider. And, but because each scope has got a different input capacitance. We can't just pick a value here and make it work. It's adjustable. So, and there's a pro compensation adjustment. Now, most scopes on the front panel will have a, it's called a probe cal or probe comp signal. It's typically a simple one kilohertz square wave. And what you would do is you'd connect up your scope probe to it. And if it looks like this, that tells me that you're undercompensated, meaning that this capacitor value here is too small and you're seeing the effect of that RC low pass filter, or you could be overcompensated. This capacitor is too large and coupling too much high frequency energy. And so the high frequency voltage division is lower than 10 X and you'd see this. And what you do is you break out that little trimmer tool and adjust the compensation capacitor to make the probe comp signal look like a perfect square wave. And then when, when you've done that, you've made, you've flattened out the frequency response of that 10 X probe. Okay, but probe compensation is important, and it really starts to matter once you get above about 10 kilohertz. Uh, at above 10 kilohertz, that's where this input capacitor starts becoming significant with respect to the one mega ohm input impedance. So again, most scopes on the on the front panel will have a probe calibration or probe compensation signal just for this purpose to compensate a probe. So again, let's talk a bit about probe ground. So I've kind of shown it as kind of this little six inch ground lead, but you have to think about if you're measuring higher frequencies, that ground lead looks like an inductor. You want to keep it short, okay, for when you're measuring higher frequencies. It also can act like a loop antenna to pick up signals. So let's take a look at some of the effect of that. So here's looking at a relatively fast logic edge coming off a logic chip that I was measuring with this like five inch ground lead. And you can see kind of this ringing distortion now, looking at that same exact signal, but using this little uh, very short probe clip, clip adapter, which is by pulling the witch's hat off, you can, you can kind of slip this thing on there. 
So a quarter inch long ground lead, I've gotten rid of all these artifacts that I saw here. These were all introduced just because of the inductance in that lead and basically creating a little bit of a tank circuit between the input capacitance of the probe and this, this ground lead inductance. So the higher you go in frequency, the faster the edges that you want to measure, you know, like on a logic signal, the shorter you need to make that ground path, okay, because it does make a difference. So let's talk a little bit about XY mode. And again, this kind of applies again to the old analog scopes, some of the old tricks that people used to use uh, for XY mode. And XY mode is where you have one channel that drives the horizontal position of the, the beam on the screen, and then the other channel drives the vertical. So it's like a, an electronic etch-a-sketch. All right. And uh, this is kind of what it looks like. <laughs> One of the things that when I was a when I was a kid in the in the 70s, I had an old analog scope and I used to hook it up to my stereo. And this is kind of what Pink Floyd looks like in XY mode. If you look at left channel and right channel on, on channel one and channel two. OK. But uh, if you um, put the same frequency onto both those channels, then the pattern that you get will will show you a basically what the phase difference is between the signals, okay? Whether you have a zero degree or, or 90 degree phase or 180 degrees phase, okay? Because again, it's like an Etch-a-Sketch. If you ever tried to draw a circle with an Etch-a-Sketch, it's kind of the same thing. Now, if you had a, put a frequent, one frequency on one channel and then double the frequency on the other channel, you'll get this kind of bilobed thing. So you can kind of tell oftentimes by the pattern, if you know the, the frequency of one input, you can put the other one on there and you can kind of figure out oftentimes if a, if a frequency is harmonically related to it or not. So not really useful, but it just kind of helps describe what the XY mode is. Now you can use um, the XY mode to do a, like, a, like a mini curve tracer. Use this kind of a circuit that's often called an octopus, where I have maybe an old filament transformer, and I use that to you know probe across a device, and then you know connect up my horizontal and vertical input in the scope, and then if I connect up to a short, it'll look like a vertical line. When it's open, it'll look like a horizontal line. A resistor will look like a slanted line. A capacitor will look like an oval. A diode, you know, a diode junction will look like an L shape. So it's like a little curve tracer almost with this little octopus circuit. Okay. Um, another more complex thing is I, I can actually use XY mode as to kind of plot out the frequency response of a filter, for example. If I have a signal generator that can create a ramped frequency, okay, going from low frequency to high, and if that, oftentimes they'll provide a voltage that's proportional to the frequency that's being put out to your device. I could drive that into the Y input, okay? And then drive the uh, X input uh, from the device and actually trace out the frequency response of say an IF filter, for example, okay? So, but again, often there's better ways of doing this these days, but these are just fun things to do with your scope if you're if you're into playing with it. So to answer the question, do I get an analog or digital scope? Uh, I would say, admittedly, in, in many cases, a digital scope is better. Automatic measurements, acquire into memory, pre-trigger, you know, all these kinds of good things for you, right? Uh, however, for RF envelopes, the analog is better, okay? At slow sweep speeds to see audio, the RF gets undersampled. Uh, you can get that aliasing, aliasing effect, that wagon wheel effect, the update rate would be slower. And you get a really nice natural intensity grading on the analog scope. This is looking at like a single sideband modulated envelope versus looking on a digital scope. It's just a lot nicer looking on the old analog scopes for that. Okay. So how might I use a scope in a ham shack? You, know, you could use it as a transmit signal monitor to look at a couple of different things. Uh, you could use it as a coax analyzer, like a time domain reflectometer. We'll talk a bit about that for a sec. Obviously, circuit troubleshooting and uh, debug and repair of your equipment and that type of thing. Uh, and then also, even with some external circuitry, measuring some unknown capacitors and inductors, a couple of ways to do that. So I've got some videos on some of these things. Uh, so monitoring the transmit output, for example, you want to be able to sample the RF signal in some way. Okay, You can use a resistive, sample, resistive divider, a capacitive divider. If you think about the old uh, station monitors, again, like the, the Kenwood uh, SM220 and that type of thing, they actually use a capacitive voltage divider 
um, uh, where there's a small capacitor feeding the deflection plates of the scope, which look like a capacitor. So you get this capacitive voltage divider effect. You could use a small resistor divider. You could use a simple pickup coil uh, or antenna. And what I've also often done too, and, and it works, is that if you've got a you know an antenna tuner or a transmatch that's got a, a multiple position antenna switch, you can connect up the scope to one of the unused ports. Now, do not switch the transmitter to that port. Uh, just you know, have it normally go to the dummy load or go to the antenna. But there's oftentimes enough wiring and stuff inside of the tuner itself to act like an antenna to couple a small amount of the RF signal into that unused port and you, enough to measure it on the scope. But just please don't connect your transmitter directly to the scope input because things will get exciting once and that'll be it. <laughs> so you could also build yourself a detector or demodulator. Um, you know, here's an example where, okay, you might have you know maybe one, one set of connections that's actually giving me the uh, a capacitive volt or excuse me a resistive voltage divider so measuring a small portion of the signal going into the scope the other half of the circuit is actually measuring using a diode detector to, to follow the amplitude of the signal uh, so that can kind of just follow the the amp modulated envelope as opposed to just the RF envelope okay and these two oftentimes connect you know you might have these separated out and have one on one side of an amplifier, one on the other side of an amplifier using XY mode. And that's what's called the, the trapezoid measurement. You ever hear of a, you, know, you see the trapezoid position on the old station monitors. That's what really what it was doing was using the, the amplitude of the signal. Okay. The magnitude of the signal to drive the X axis and then the envelope to drive the Y for example. Okay. So monitoring the RF envelope, you can look for things like flat topping on single sideband signals, look at the PSK you know, envelope you know, when you're doing you know, modulation with PSK and other digital modes, look at AM modulation depth. You can actually compute your modulation depth by looking at the peaks and the troughs of the AM, AF, AM envelope. Um, to do uh, some analysis on your coax, to look like a, a, a TDR. With a TDR, you can look at things like coax impedance or coax length or distance to fault, that type of thing. And the idea is, is that you inject a fast pulse into your coax, and it, it goes down and, and tra traverses down the line and then will reach the load. But if that load is, say, an open or a short circuit, you're going to get a reflection back. Or if there's a break in the line, that will cause a reflection to come back. And that will be reflected on uh, the waveform. Because if we're measuring the scope right here, initially, when we first apply that pulse, the transmission line looks like a 50 ohm load, like it's a 50 ohm transmission line. But if there's a break in the line, all of a sudden that goes from 50 ohm to a high impedance, then you get a voltage transition that works its way back and then eventually adds up here. So you'll see essentially twice the propagation delay to the open. That's what that delta T is. You'll see the initial pulse, and then the reflective thing that came back from your load. And that reflects the round trip delay from the open and back again. And now if you, for example, if you uh, know the velocity factor of your coax, you can then from that time delay, calculate how far it is to that break or that open in the coax. Um, you could also put a variable load at the end and adjust the load up or down until that reflection goes away and then measure that resistor value, and that'll tell you what the uh, impedance is of that transmission line. I threw some numbers in here for a 50 ohm you know, line with a velocity factor of 0.66, and just kind of sh show you that the signal is going to traverse about 7.8 inches every nanosecond. So if I measured you know, 100 nanoseconds, that means I'm looking at about 800 inches, or yeah, 800 inches or so, and then compute, convert that to feet and that type of thing. So, so I just did some of the math here to kind of convert it to feet easily for you. So if you measure that delta T from, you know, your, your incident pulse to the reflected coming back, just take that delta T divided by 3.081 for a velocity factor, when you have coax as velocity factor 0.66, and that'll tell you the length of that coax. And then for a velocity factor of 0.79, you know, like the Teflon stuff, uh, that's just a different factor. But again, I got some videos that cover some of that.
Um, how about measuring inductors and capacitors? Again, if I use that same fast edge pulse generator that I used for my TDR, if I uh, just simply feed that through, say, a known resistor value into a capacitor, and I measure the voltage here, I'm going to get it. It's basically I'm going to see the RC rise time, all right? And I got a nice RC time constant. Now, the, the fun thing about that is that um, you may remember that that RC time constant, the voltage charges up to 63% of the full value at one RC time constant, meaning R times C, okay? Now, what's, what's handy is if you adjust the scope so that the peak, the whole waveform, occupies eight divisions, 63% of that is five divisions. So all you have to do is count how long it takes to go from baseline up five divisions out of eight. And now you know the, um, that RC time constant, you know that T. So then you just divide by the known resistor value and you have the capacitance value, simple as that. Now to measure inductors, you could use this bottom portion here where what I'll do, I'll say, take that same fast edge, couple it through a small capacitor into a tank circuit with a known value capacitor, say a nanofarad. Uh, this small capacitor is just going to couple the high frequency energy from the pulse into here, and it's going to bang on this uh, LC tank circuit. And this LC tank circuit is going to ring at its resonant frequency. So if you measure that frequency, the, the resonant frequency is basically this formula. So we'll, re we'll rearrange that. We can compute an unknown inductor value. With a, as long as I can measure the frequency and I have a known capacitor value there. So again, that's a lot more complicated than using an LCR meter, but it's more fun than using an LCR meter in my mind. Okay. So anyway, with that, um, I probably went a little bit over in time, um, but I appreciate uh, everybody being here. And again, this is my YouTube channel uh, and my email address. If you have any questions, you can always kind of come back uh, I don't see any questions that popped up in the chat. So either I'll put everybody to sleep or nobody's got any questions at all. So we have a couple of questions. I think we have some. Yeah, let's see. Um, Stu? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. Uh, I, I would just like you to touch just momentarily on bringing a 50 ohm signal into a scope and the requirement for the 50 ohm termination on the input if your scope will not convert over. And then the second portion of that, of course, is you touch briefly on attenuation uh, going into the scope. I put a thousand watts into a scope at my jack. And I need a lot. Yes, <laughs> I, I have I have an attenuator that will handle that and bring it down about uh, 60 dB, but okay, yeah, I just want you to touch a little bit on the importance of that because it's sure, easy sure. to load these cheap Chinese scopes up. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so first let's talk about the 50 ohm termination. Maybe I'll scoot back to uh, so I'll, I'll find a picture here while we're, while we're I'm talking. So in general, you know, any kind of RF that's going through coax, it's a good idea to properly terminate that coax with 50 ohms because then you don't get any reflected wave, you don't get any SWR, that type of thing, right? If you're using this to look at relatively low level signals and you're not really terribly, in terribly interested in actual amplitude and that type of a thing, um, it's not that important to be properly 50 ohm terminated, okay? But if you are... You know, if you're bringing something in from a sampler and you don't want any reflected energy coming off your scope and going back into the sampler, for example, then it's a, a good idea to to properly terminate at the scope input. Now, again, not all scopes have a 50 ohm termination selection. So what do you do? Uh, you can actually buy, you build or buy a, a 50 ohm through termination which has got a BNC female and male on one end and the other, and then internally has got a 50 ohm resistor. So you plug that onto the scope and then plug your, your coax onto that. Okay, that, would, that will provide the 50 ohm termination if your scope doesn't have one. And generally, they're gonna have some a, a power rating associated with them as well. And again, if you're coming out off of, in your case, you've got a, a beefy enough attenuator to, to bring your kilowatt down, you know, you know, 40 or 60 dB, it's only going to be an accurate 40 or 60 dB if the other end of that attenuator is loaded into 50 ohms. 
Okay. If you load it into a, a one mega ohm, it's not going to be exactly that right attenuation value. So if you're trying to measure, say, the amplitude on the scope to va to validate the output power that you're generating, it won't be accurate unless it has got that 50 ohm termination on it. Okay. Now, in your case, if you're using actual attenuators to get down to that and you've got the attenuators are valid, you can actually use that method to actually measure RF power. But in most cases, if you're using an RF sampler, like a capacitive sampler or something like that, they're generally not calibrated and you're just using them to look at relative signal levels. And what you might do is say, well, if I've got a, another way of accurately measuring power, like through a, you know, I got a, you know, my bird watt meter or I got whatever to measure power. And then I look at that amplitude through my RF sampler into the scope. I can then do a, a kind of a, a calibration on my own saying, okay, I know that hundred Watts is this big on the scope. And I know that hundred Watts equals to so many volts peak to peak. And I know that that's what that represents. So if my voltage gets cut in half, then, you know, from that, then I know that my power is cut by a factor of four, right? So you can kind of do your in situ calibration that way. But in general, when you're looking at RF like that through a sampler or through an attenuator, you would like to have a 50 ohm termination there. Okay. Did I, did I answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, two more questions. Tom? Uh, yeah, very quickly is the, uh, when you were talking about triggering in scopes and so forth, you've talked about self-triggering. Is, yep. example, is an electrocardiogram an example of a self-triggering kind of scope? Where the, you know, there's a constant in it, a time constant that goes across the screen and then it wipes the screen again. Would that be an example of self-triggering? Yeah, generally it is. Um, you know, the you know, on an electrocardiogram is really nothing more than a specialized analog. Well, they're digital now, but we're analog scopes with kind of a long, long display phosphor on it, right? And uh, and they would generally be self-triggered. You know, the physician or whatever might set up how you know there may be some standard to it too. I'm not I'm not a medical doctor. There may be some standard to you know how fast they typically move across the screen, but generally they'll just refresh and start themselves. So you'll notice sometimes that the beats don't always line up at the same radical for each sweep because we're not triggering on a beat, right? If the if it was set up to trigger on a beat, you might see that each of your, your heartbeats line up at the same radical for each sweep, right? That would be the difference between, you know, kind of a self-auto trigger versus a an input triggered uh, type of a sweep. And one more question, go ahead. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about calibrating uh, scopes? And sure. Um, I actually, uh, I do have a video on calibrating analog scopes um, that you could search on my channel for. Um, generally, what's involved in calibrating an analog scope is uh, calibrating the, the vertical scale settings, okay, to ensure that if you set it to one volt per division, it's actually one volt to drive the deflection. And there may be, you know, you, you would have to have some you know, signal source that you have verified another way that has got that is, you know, to its amplitude so that you're you're measuring against something. And then generally also uh, calibrating the horizontal sweep. So if you told it to be so many seconds per division, you know, that's actually what you're getting. And, you know, one of the instruments that was typically used back in the day to do that is something called a time mark generator, which would output little blips at user specified intervals. And you'd put that into the scope, and it was very easy to see if those blips all lined up with each gradical, and then you can make the adjustments that way. Um, so uh, those are the major calibration adjustments. There will also be things like frequency response adjustments and things like that, but it really comes down to that particular scope and what, uh, and, and the, the service manual for it will kind of indicate what is required and what the process is and the equipment needed to do the calibration, but it's generally uh, input input amplitude response, input frequency response, and horizontal sweep rate and horizontal you know, horizontal scale are the major calibration points. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've, the video I have is an old Heath kit, like thirty megahertz Heath kit analog scope, and it actually had a calibration manual. So I kind of walked through doing the calibration on that in, in the video that I did. So. And that would be kind of typical of most analog scopes, but any of the the high, really high frequency scopes or the more modern digital stuff, um, generally you most of us wouldn't have 
the equipment necessary to generate the standard signals that are necessary to do the calibration in a proper way. I have a fun question. Okay. Is it true that Tektronics used to take the oscilloscopes out in the yard and hose them off before working on them? <laughs> uh, back in the day of the old, um, you know, pre pre printed circuit board, you know, when we had ceramic strip wiring and vacuum tubes and and all that type of stuff, it was pretty common to to soap them up and hose them down <laughs> to get all the grease and dirt and dust out of them and dry them all off and then go in and work on them. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. And everybody can go to you can go on the great channel. I've already watched the one on Anderson Powerful Connections and, and he's really good. So any more questions you can find them there online. <laughs> so thank you, Alan. Oh, thank um, you very much. Yeah, great having you. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's it's late. Thank you, Alan. It's really great. No, I'm glad everybody enjoyed it. And yeah, I'm sorry I went over. I know that uh, you said let's talk for a half an hour and questions, and I think I tripled oh. that. But sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> We're just going to blow through our clothes this really quickly. All right. Well, it's midnight here, so I think I'm going to take off and hit the rocks. I got a work day tomorrow, but uh, thanks again for having me. And any questions that you think of afterwards, shoot me an email. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. All right. Take care now.